What's up Valley Creek students? Welcome to Student Circles. We're in a series called the Hope Carrier Initiative, and we're talking about what it looks like to change our world, what it looks like to live on mission with God, and what it looks like to live in the kingdom in the midst of this world. And the whole point of this series is to stir up things in your soul. It's to create questions that cause you to look at your life and see what you're doing and why you're doing it. And so we're a few weeks in, can I just ask, how are you doing? Like, how are you doing with the series? Are you living differently? Are you thinking differently? Are you starting to have some questions stirred up in your soul? Is there a sense of discontentment with your daily life? Are you dreaming with God? Like, what have you been doing with what you've learned? How have you been activating your faith outside of church? Have you been spending time with God, talking to him, reading his word, talking about it with your godly relationships? Like, how are you doing? See, the whole point of the series is to activate your faith, to stir up some things in your soul and to feel a little uncomfortable. And that's because we don't just wanna finish the series and move on. We wanna become hope carriers as we go into the rest of our lives. And remember, a hope carrier is a disciple of Jesus living on mission to change their world. A disciple of Jesus, someone whose whole world has been interrupted by Jesus and now they're on a journey to become more like him living on mission, someone who believes that their entire life is a part of the very purpose of God and to change their world. The belief that God is using you to release his kingdom to the world around you. To release his kingdom, we first have to discover what the kingdom is. So Holy Spirit, would you open the eyes of our heart so we can discover more of the kingdom? We don't just wanna understand up here, we wanna understand in here. So check this out. The kingdom is here and it's available to you and I. We need to learn to understand it in our hearts. And so then you have to say, what is the kingdom? Well, you've been hearing me say this every week. Maybe this is the time you write it down. The kingdom is the rule and reign of God. It's where things are submitted and surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus. It's the range or the extent of the effective will of God. It's what God is doing and it is the very life of God. So break that down, the rule. Remember in the Bible, rule is not to oppress and push down. Rule means to lift up. So the kingdom of God is what God is blessing, serving, empowering, protecting. Reign means to be king and to have the highest influence. So it's where God is king and is influencing things. Submit, submission, to come under the mission of someone else. So the kingdom is where things have come under the very mission of God and surrender, where they have given up their will. and No longer fight against God, but now align with God. In fact, the greatest way to probably understand God's kingdom, and this is what I would encourage you to write down, is God's kingdom is where his will is is done. God's kingdom is where his will is done. In fact, when Jesus teaches us how to pray, he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So catch it. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So wherever God's will is done, his kingdom has just come. If it's pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, then whenever his will is done, his kingdom has just come. So wherever his will is not done, his kingdom has not come. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's the difference? Well, in heaven, God's kingdom has come. Why? Because his will is immediately and instantly done. What he wants, what he desires, what he directs, what he dictates through words and actions, it immediately happens in heaven. And he says, pray that his kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. Why? because on earth there are a whole bunch of kings with kingdoms and queens with queendoms that have their own will and wanna do it their way. See, a kingdom is simply the king's domain and every king has a will and they have a domain and, and that will is released through their words and their actions and wherever things submit and surrender to its words and its actions is the extent of the domain in which it rules and reigns. And when God made us, Adam and Eve in the garden, he gave us a kingdom, this earth, a domain in which we would rule over with our words and actions and he gave us free will. It's that whole concept, free will. Why? Because to be made in the image and likeness of God is to have a will. 
is to have emotions and preferences and desires and wants. And the question was, were we gonna submit that to God or are we gonna take our kingdom and rebel against it and try to be our own king of our own kingdom? And so the question you have to ask is if his kingdom comes where his will is done, then what's the biggest barrier of God's kingdom coming to this earth? Those horrible people of the world and the way they live. No. The powers and principalities of darkness. No. Your will and my will are the biggest barriers of seeing God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. See, sin is simply when I choose my will even though I know it's contrary to God's will. Obedience is when I choose God's will even when it's contrary to my will. I mean, think about it. When Jesus invites us to follow him, he calls the crowd along with his disciples and says, if anyone, would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. In other words, Jesus says, if you really wanna come after me, you gotta give up your will. You gotta surrender your will, take up your cross, do some things that you might not wanna do and follow me and allow my will to become a part of your life. Your will leads to death. My will leads to life. You gotta surrender your will to the Lord. And I love that he says the crowd and the disciples. In other words, he says, all y'all. All y'all. Not just like, oh, the super spiritual people that have been walking with God for years. Nope, nope. The crowd and all y'all. All y'all, he doesn't say, just come to church and it'll be great. Nope. He says, you gotta give up your will if you're gonna be a part of the kingdom. Why? Because the king has a different will and we need to learn to step into it. Or how about this verse? I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. This is an awesome verse to put on your social media when you're about to play a big game. We put it on knickknacks in our house. We have no idea what it means. I've been crucified with Christ. You know what that means? My will has been crucified. My wants, my desires, my opinions, my preferences have officially been dead, they're buried, and they're gone, and now His will is what begins to live and flow through me. The works of the flesh are your will. The fruit of the Spirit is His will. So ready? When did you surrender your will to God. When did you surrender your will to God? Notice I didn't say, when did you pray a prayer and raise your hand in church to get saved? When did you surrender your will to God? Say, God, I want your kingdom to come and your will to be done. Therefore, it means my will must become submitted and surrendered to yours. See, this is kingdom. This is not American church. American church is I'm saved. I got a ticket to heaven when I die. Jesus says, I don't want you to wait till when you die to enjoy heaven. I want to give heaven to you in the here and now. But for his kingdom to come, his will has to be done and mine has to be crucified. Think about a stallion for a second. Think about this big, beautiful black stallion and it's got muscles ripping off of its body everywhere you look at it. It's powerful, it's strong, it's majestic, it's beautiful. And what do we say has to happen to that stallion before it can be useful to the master? It has to be broken. We say broken, we don't mean break its legs so it's like hobbling around. Its will has to be broken because otherwise it bucks and bronks and it has its own will and it's wild and it does what it wants. And if it hasn't been broken, the master can't use it. The master can't take it and ride it into adventures and, and great discoveries and go on missions. No, no, that stallion will stay in the stable. It's a great picture for us. 
Maybe we don't really see the kingdom flow in our lives because we have yet to be broken, submit our will to the master. Because once that stallion is broken through a simple little bit and bridle in its mouth, the rider can take it anywhere he wants it to go. The question is, is have you been broken enough before the Lord that with a simple bit and a bridle, with a single word, can you move to the left or right based on what God is saying to you? I mean, you remember the story of the rich young ruler? He's rich, he's young, and he's ruler. That boy got a will. He's got his desires and his wants and his preferences and his opinions. And he comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, how can I be a part of the kingdom? How can I have the life of God in my life? And Jesus says, sell everything you've got, give it to the poor, then come follow me. And at that, the man's face fell sad and he turned around and he walked away and Jesus looked and he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. How hard it is for the wealthy, for the independent, for the self-made, for the affluent, for the prideful, for the judgmental, for the, the condemner, for those who think they have it all and don't need anything else, how hard it is for them to enter into the rule and reign of God, the life of God. Why? Because the more you have, the harder it is to surrender your will. The more you have, the harder it is to say, not my will, but yours. So can I ask you, what are you rich in? What are you wealthy in? Are you wealthy in money, in time, in possessions, in relationships, in talent, in ability? What are you rich in? Because that's the place that's hard for you to live in the kingdom of God until you learn to submit it and surrender it to him. Come on, if you're rich literally with money, then you need to tithe. Why? Because it breaks your will. It says, God, not my will, but yours. This is not what I want to do with my money, but it's what you want me to do with my money. So I need to break this thing in me. If you're rich in time, you know what you need to do? You need to get on a serve team or someone else is telling you what to do and when to do it. Why? Because you're rich in time. So you hold on to this thing and it needs to be broken, not my will, but yours. If you're rich in influence, you know what you need to do? You need to be a part of something where no one cares about who you are. Because it will break your will that everyone's not listening to you and wanting to know what you think. If you're rich in pleasure, you need to do something that causes you to suffer. Suffer, because it breaks your will. God's not trying to take anything away from you. He's trying to give everything to you. You just have to learn to think differently about this. Are you with me on this? So come on, what would it look like for God's kingdom to come in your life? The kingdom of heaven is at hand, so we don't have to wait to get to heaven someday. We can bring heaven to earth today. And while we're still in this world, we're no longer of this world. We're a part of something bigger, the kingdom of God. God's kingdom comes wherever his will is done, so his kingdom only comes where we're willing to submit to him. So what would it look like for you to submit your will to God's will? Let's turn to our tables now.